Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Royal Society, uh, especially if this is your first visit here. Um, I'm Jean Thomas and I'm the Biological Secretary and a Vice President of the Royal Society and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecture. But before I do that, could I ask everyone to turn off their mobile phones please, or at least put them on mute. Um, this lecture is being uh, webcast live and also being filmed for the Royal Society Archive. So we don't want too many sound effects um, while it's going on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is the first year that the Cavalry Medal um, has been awarded, and from now on it will be awarded biennially in odd years for excellence in all fields of science and engineering relevant to the environment or energy. The 2011 Cavalry Medal was awarded to Professor Claire Gray uh, for her pioneering work on the use of solid-state NMR in the field of lithium-ion batteries. Claire Gray is the Geoffrey Morehouse Gibson Professor of Chemistry in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge and also retains an affiliation with Stony Brook University uh, in the United States where she was previously and remains as Associate Director of the Northeastern Centre for Chemical Energy Storage um, at Stony Brook. Uh, a bit of career history, Claire graduated from Oxford with a first class honours degree in chemistry in 1987 and took a DPhil in 1991. After a year as a Royal Society postdoctoral fellow in Nijmegen University, she then spent two years at DuPont, and then in 1994, I think, joined uh, Stony Brook, where she has an affiliation, as I said, right up to the present. Professor Gray is a recognised world leader in the use of solid-state uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, to study structure and function of inorganic materials. She has pioneered groundbreaking in situ NMR studies of batteries and fuel cells, which have provided a greatly enhanced understanding of the processes that occur when a battery charges and discharges and when a fuel cell operates. This work clearly has a direct and important impact on the optimization and development of systems for energy storage and conversion. Uh, for this work and her other work, Claire Gray was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2011. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Claire Gray to give the first Cavley Medal Lecture. Well, it's an honour to be here, and thank you very much for the, the wonderful introduction. And with an introduction like that, it's always difficult to follow. But thank you very much all for coming to listening, listen to my award lecture. So the work that we've been doing over the last two years, um, in Cambridge over the last two years and before that in Stony Brook, has been very much involved in trying to develop materials to try and make an impact on problems that are relevant to energy technology and specifically areas associated with rapid increases in carbon dioxide levels globally. And so if one thinks about possible solutions to reducing CO2 emissions, there are a number of different approaches. And the two areas that I want to touch upon today are, are thinking about how to re reduce CO2 emissions by increasing efficiency and also the, how to use um, increasingly more carbon-neutral or carbon-free renewables. So if we step back for a moment and think about um, the UK CO2 emissions area and you look at the different sectors, you can see that these are numbers from 1970 to the present day, that really the largest um, sources of CO2 come from the so-called energy supply, so that's um, making um, energy or electricity largely from power stations, and also in transport, with business and residential areas being other large sources of CO2. And so what I want to talk about today is how we can use lithium-ion batteries and supercapacitors to try and make impact in reducing CO2 in those type particular areas. And so just focusing on transport for a moment, the embarrassing figure is uh, that the transport figure is dominated by emissions from cars. And um, I think most of us probably came by train today, and the trains represent a very small fraction of the CO2 emissions in the UK. So what I want to do in this talk, uh, remind people what batteries are, and how, demonstrate how they play a role in reducing CO2, and then talk about some of the technolo 
technological challenges, where some of the fundamental science is needed, and then end by telling you a little bit about what we're doing in this area to address some of these issues. So for those of you who don't dream about batteries, I just want to remind you <laughs> what a, lith a battery is. And I want to step back and um, discuss a NICAD battery, which were the old rechargeables that you had in many devices. And so the basis of all of this technology is to identify a negative electrode or an anode and a positive electrode or cathode where you have reversible chemistry. So in this system, cadmium zero or cadmium metal goes to two plus and releases an electron. And on the other side, a nickel three plus oxyhydroxide is reduced to a nickel two plus reducing, uh, and releasing a hydroxide ion. That hydroxide ion then moves through the electrolyte, in this case an aqueous electrolyte, where it can go to the other side and react with the cadmium to form the cadmium hydroxide. And so you connect this up by an electrical circuit to produce a voltage. And that voltage is controlled by these two half-cell reactions. And so you need to find chemistry that can rever go reversibly react backwards and forwards. And you need to have an electrolyte that allows the ions to move through, but not the current. A supercapacitor, which is the other area I want to talk about, is slightly different. So these are like capacitors that you may have come across, except they now operate by finding a material with a very high surface area. So typically that would be a material that's a porous structure. So if you think about Swiss cheeses, you create lots of internal surface areas by having holes. And the similar sorts of approaches are used here. And then you put these two porous structures um, and separate them now by a salt solution. And now when you charge the supercapacitor, the charge is then compensated by anions and cations in the salt solution that are attracted to the positively charged, in this case, carbon, and then the negatively charged carbon to get an increased capacitance. And I'll come back to those devices later on in my talk. So it's a very exciting area to be in as a materials chemist because there are a lot of different applications that use batteries and supercapacitors. And so you go from these smaller devices, such as laptops and mobile phones, where batteries are really technology enablers. If you didn't have lithium-ion batteries, you can't imagine the mobile technology that we're all familiar with today. Then you move through to much bigger applications in transport and finally in the grid, where you have very different batteries with very different requirements. We're very concerned by safety when it comes to transport. And when it comes to batteries for the grid, it's an issue of scalability. You need to make batteries that are really going to be big enough to impact grid storage. And they also have to be sufficiently cheap. So let me just talk a little bit about grid applications. So one of the, um, the issues with the, it, putting, um, or putting more renewables on the grid is this whole idea of intermittent power supplies. So we're all familiar with the fact that the sun is only shining in Britain for short periods of time. And wind, similarly, is intermittent. And so, how, so how do you balance the demand with the wind so that you can ensure electricity when people want it? So the grid is not a mechanism for, to store electricity. So we need to put mechanisms or devices that allow you to go back, which, backwards and forwards between chemical energy and electrical energy by storage devices such as batteries and also mechanisms for converting backwards and forwards, such as a fuel cell. And so you can't continue to build the windmills that are being projected um, to be built in Britain without addressing how you're going to store the electricity on the grid. So there was no wind in Scotland for pretty much all of February. How do you then ensure that there's still an electricity supply for, for the, the, that part of the country to function? So storage on the grid is a real challenge because you've got very large ranges of sizes that are needed and also timescales. And so you've got the whole issue of coming up with power to, to manage renewable energy management, to ensure that um, in periods of no wind or when the sun isn't shining, you still have electricity. And then you also have issues of fluctuations and short-term responses. When everybody comes home at 6 o'clock in the evening and switches on the kettle, how do you manage that short-term response? And so very different um, types of applications and, and technologies are required. So the big applications will rely on pumped hydro and compressed air storage, but the very short and rapid responses are where, for example, lithium-ion batteries 
and supercapacitors are going to be important. And surprisingly, even though these um, devices are expensive, they still come in um, as being uh, effective from an a cost perspective because of the associated costs with commissioning and building new power plants that take a long time um, to be built. And also, if you, you don't want to have excess power plants doing nothing, sitting around waiting for when there's no wind. Um, so as a result, countries around the world are putting in demonstration projects to, uh, to demonstrate the use of some of these batteries. And so I just wanted to show you these pictures to give you an idea of the sort of sizes of these things. So this is the picture of a sodium sulfur battery from Japan. And so here's the compulsory picture of Mount Fuji in the background, which gives you an idea of the scale. So this is a, an apartment block. And so these are massive batteries, the sizes of this room. And here's another one in um, the south of the US. So these are ones based on so-called sodium sulfur technology, but there are also battery applications, uh, demonstration projects involving lithium-ion batteries. And this is an artist rendition of one that's going on, going in to um, integrate wind in California. So I just want to spend a few minutes and illustrate now how batteries will make a, or do already play a role in, in efficiency or reducing emissions in transport. So many of you are familiar with the Toyota Prius, which is sort of the um, poster child of the hybrid electric vehicle. And where the battery plays a role in, in this technology is to ensure that the internal combustion engine works in its most efficient regime. So in regimes when you're changing or um, you're running at s slow <coughs> town-type um, speeds or when you're changing gears, you can ensure that the engine is running in its optimum regime. You can also use something called regenerative braking. So that's when you put your foot on the brake. You use the kinetic energy from braking to then charge the battery. And so you think about what's needed for this application. If you're going to use regenerative braking, you've got to take all of that kinetic energy from braking and then use that to very rapidly charge a battery. So you need a very, very high power battery. And then if you move into the next generations of systems, the so-called plug-ins, you can take a Prius and you can put a lithium-ion battery in it and you can put a plug in the thing instead of the, um, the normal cap. And that gives you a so-called range-extended hybrid electric vehicle. Or you can change the whole um, game in the so-called Chevy Volt or the, the real or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle where now the battery runs the electric powertrain. And then you have a second method for electricity generation, which at the moment is a combustion engine, but hopefully down the road will be a fuel cell, which then allows you to go further distances. So what the concept is, is to try and get a battery that allows you to go about 40 miles and capture most driving habits, and so that you can then plug this in overnight. And then if you want to go further afield, you can then use your secondary form of electricity generation. So now you're looking for, to design a battery the way you both need energy and power for these applications. And then the final application is an electric vehicle, where the smaller cars, such as the Nissan Leaf, that are being produced in Sunderland at a cost of about 32,000 US dollars to the sports car Tesla at 109,000, where a lot of this is the sports car body, but also the difference in price between these two cars comes from the size of the battery pack. So you've got a 24 kilowatt hour battery pack in the Nissan Leaf, and you've got a 53 kilowatt hour pack in the Tesla, which then t translates directly into the range for the battery. The, the Nissan Leaf comes with um, two ways of charging. You can charge very fast. So the aim is to try and design a battery that allows you to get most of the charging when you sit down and maybe have a cup of coffee. Uh, but then to do a full charge, you're going to have to maybe to do this overnight. And then you move into applications which are already, um, there's a tremendous impact, particularly in um, China and in Asia, where um, you have electric bicycles, where you can significantly reduce CO2 by replacing um, an electric bicycle, by replacing, sorry, a motorbike with an electric assist bicycle, electric scooters, and also small electric vehicles, where you basically take the engines of the small back bicycles or scooters put a uh, metallic shell around them and sell them very, very cheaply into places with limited um, fuel distribution systems. So supercapacitors um, have, don't have the same capacity or the same energy density, 
But what they do have is the ability to provide power very, very quickly. And this, this is a so-called Rigoni plot, which plots the energy on one side with the power on the other side. And so you can see all the lithium-ion batteries have larger amounts of energy, but the supercapacitors allow you to get the energy out quickly, so have higher power. And so they find uses, or are starting to find uses, in applications where that's important. And so this is the, so-called, this is the famous um, supercapacitor um, crane where you can then use the lift, um, where you pull a lift, you can then use that to charge the capacitor so that the lift then can then pull the lift up on the other side. You've got trams now that have supercapacitors in them where you can charge your supercapacitor up very quickly when it comes to rest or you can, and also you can convert from regenerative braking. You can use that to charge your supercapacitor. And this is the bus in Shanghai that allows that is charged every time the bus comes to a stop at each bus station and it goes from stop to stop, charging at each bus station. So as long as there's no traffic jams in between the bus stops, all is good. <laughs> so whether that works in London is another matter, and in Shanghai. So let's think about how we're going to build a rechargeable battery and a better one. So I talked about the cadmium chemistry in the NICAD system. If you move away from cadmium and lead and you move to lithium, you gain about two, voltage, two volts in the, the potential of the cell, and that's primarily because you've got this very reactive lithium metal or a very electropositive ion that's very easy to remove an electron from. And so Sony put this, this all together in 1990, making use of chemistry that was developed by John Goodenough when he was head of inorganic chemistry at Oxford University, where he'd been working on the lithium cobalt oxide system. And at the same time, um, scientists in the US, Don Murphy and Bruno Scrisatti in Italy, and others had been working on the use of graphite and intercalating that with ions such as lithium. And so they put it together to form the so-called rocking chair battery, where the lithiums go backwards and forwards for multiple cycles. And the principle is you take materials that are layered, and you can pull the lithiums out of this structure, leaving the, the layers of oxygen and cobalt intact, and you can do this many times. The lithium ions then move through a non-aqueous electrolyte where the lithiums are then intercalated safely within the carbon layers. So it sounds quite simple in, in, in concept, but actually it's quite a black art, as my students know, to make these things. So you take your active material, uh, in this case the lithium cobalt oxide, you mix it with carbon to produce a percolating pathway of electrons to allow you to get the electrons in and out, and then you mix it together with a binder, a polymer, to hold it all together. And the reason you do this is every time you pull the lithiums in and out of these materials, they expand and contract. And so you want to ensure that after hundreds of cycles, you can still get the electrons into the structures, there's still connectivity, and you don't have so-called dead lithium in the material. So this just shows you a comparison of the technology um, from the early days. Here's lithium ion in comparison to lithium lead acid and NICAD systems, and after 10 years of um, incremental developments, we've made significant progress in increasing the, the energy density of these systems. So I want to now think about um, some, of the, where f- some of the major issues that remain and uh, where fundamental research is needed to really design batteries that are going to work in hybrid electric vehicles, electric vehicles, and for grid applications. So one of the big issues is the range. So this is the typical range from the epicenter in Cambridge of, um, of a Tesla. So a Tesla can get to Leeds, a Leaf can get you to Nottingham, and then you have a traffic jam, or it's winter, and you put your heating on, and the range of the Leaf drops from 100 miles to 62 miles, and maybe you can only get to Leicester. So there's, there's some solutions that people are thinking about. So you don't need to heat the whole car. If you put nice little seat warmers on or you warm the the steering wheels, then perhaps you can get away and minimise the heating. Or perhaps you'll even have a secondary gasoline-powered heating system. Or maybe, as some people propose, you might have battery swap systems. And this is a company in, in Israel that is proposing to set up schemes for swapping out batteries. So these batteries are about this size, so it's not as if it's not like just swapping your, your lead acid system. It's really um, going to be, have to be done by robots. One of the real issues is the capacity retention. 
And so this is just for those of us who are a little bit mathematically challenged to think about how good does your battery have to be. So if you have a battery that lasts for two years, so that would be a battery that you might have in your laptop if you're lucky. That battery, if it's 99.5% efficient, so in other words, it's losing about half a percent of its capacity every time you charge and discharge, after two years, it'll be completely dead. And if you think about then what it takes to make a battery that's going to last for seven years, which is sort of the, the thought, the, the, the minimum time that your car battery would have to work for, you need a battery that's 99.97% efficient. And even then, it will only go half the distance after seven years. And if it only went 100 miles when you bought it, going 50 miles is a significant decrease in performance. So this is a real challenge for chemistry. So it means that every time you cycle, all of the side reactions that I'll talk about in a second have to be minimized if you have any chance of meeting that goal. If you think about applications in the grid, utilities um, companies expect things to be operating in the 20 to 40 years lifetimes. And so that's a e much bigger challenge to try and meet that. It's also a challenge from a, technological, uh, from a scientific perspective. Um, how do you actually measure it? So most of us do research projects that last for years or two years. How do you know your battery is going to operate and function in 20 years? So that problem is solved in um, pacemaker batteries, where it's another area where you really want to know that your lithium ion or your um, silver vanadate battery is working. And what people do there is they um, make a, a whole production of batteries and they take 50% 50, 50 of them out and they get them running and they run them for about two years and if that batch is working fine then they put them into humans and then they have a two year lead so if they discover four years down the road that something's wrong they have two years to get them out of people but this is something that you can't do in cars because it's just too expensive so it is a challenge to think about how you identify the failure mechanisms that are going to be relevant not just in the next month, but down the road. There's also the serious challenge of cost, and one needs to think about whether cost is going to be a killer for an electric vehicle. And the issue really is that the battery cost really um, correlates directly with range. And so we have about a factor of three to four in cost reduction that's got to be generated in order for electric vehicles to really penetrate into the consumer mar market at prices that people would, be fi would find acceptable. And this problem is going to be even more severe for grid applications. So moving from the sort of more technological aspects, let's think about some of the chemistries and what some of the issues are and what we can do to look at this. So let's return back to the lithium cobalt oxide system and think about that. So want, where, does, where is the issue of cost coming from? Well, a lot of it is coming from the fact that cobalt is a very expensive mineral and it's also toxic. And there's not enough to cobalt around globally if we were to scale up to the sorts of sizes. Remember, the um, grid-type applications are the size of this room. So we really have to think about making systems with cheap resources, so manganese and iron. Then there are sort of chemistry reasons. So these materials are limited in their capacity. So cobalt, lithium cobalt oxide, is an oxidation state of cobalt 3 plus, and we oxidize the cobalt 3 plus to 4 plus. So we give up one electron in principle, and that dictates how many electrons you can get out of the system. But in practice, so here's a schematic of the structure, and I pull all of the lithiums out of this material, and what happens in this structure is that the layers slip or shear, a bit like a cards that you um, sh um, pushing a pack of cards, and then it becomes very difficult to get the lithiums back in again. And so you can't actually operate this material pulling all of the lithium out, so using the full theoretical capacity of this material. So what you do in practice is you leave about half the lithiums in there so that you can go backwards and forwards. And so if we as chemists could find a way of getting the lithiums back in and out and solve some of these problems, we could design a battery that would be almost it would have twice the energy density. Then we have the issue of power. So we can't actually get the lithiums in and out fast enough to allow you to get the sufficient charge and discharge rates that are suitable for electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And then the final one that's very important is safety. 
So these are some famous um, photographs on the web. This is the Dell laptop going up in smoke in Japan. And this is the back of a UPS plane, and these are lithium-ion batteries that went up. They were just sitting there um, and supposedly caused this fire. And so if you think about these incidents, um, and this is going to be one of the major reasons that this technology is not adopted, if these incidents are more widespread. Um, so let me just think, discuss some of these safety aspects and where, and where you get capacity fade to sort of address the questions that I often get as to why lithium-ion batteries die. So the lithium-ion battery has um, the electrodes, um, such as the lithium cobalt oxide and the, the carbon, and it also has the electrolyte. And one of the problems is it's very difficult to find an electrolyte, so a solution containing salts, that's stable when you charge your battery. So when you charge a battery, you make very oxidized products and very reduced products. And so you need to find an electrolyte that doesn't react with either of those highly oxidizing and highly reduced things. And in practice, the electrolyte is only metastable. In other words, it, it, is, it will actually react if it was allowed. And it's only um, prevented from reacting by the formation of a so-called surface electrolyte phase. So this is a film that covers, for example, the graphite when you cycle. So you make a battery and you actually cycle and charge and discharge it once in the factory to produce this passivating cover. And it's this cover that prevents further reaction. But what actually happens with time is that this reaction does continue, particularly if you sit there with the lap your laptop on your lap, it gets hotter and hotter, this reaction continues, and every decomposition reacts on, results in removing lithium from the cell. And there's only a finite amount of lithium, so every side reaction results in loss of capacity. There are issues of the particle expansions. So this uh, particles getting bigger and smaller leads to cracking. It also leads to movement of particles. And so you end up with particles that actually you can't access anymore, and so-called dead lithium that just does nothing in the cell. Mm. Then there are more serious issues. And this is the idea that when you start with a lithium um, structure and you pull lithium out, you form a metastable phase. So a metastable phase is one that's not in its thermodynamic minimum. So it wants to react over time to produce the thermodynamic product. And it's only because of the kinetics, so the difficulty of that reaction, that it doesn't do it. And so if you heat your lithium-ion battery up by mistake, then it can decompose to go back to the original thermodynamic state and re release oxygen and heat at the same time. And it's this heat that reacts with the organic electrolyte that's responsible for these fires that you see here and this poor fire in a, in a Prius with a new lithium-ion battery in it. And one of the problems is that the heat that's generated causes more decomposition, that causes more heat, and you get this thing called thermal runaway that causes these fires. And so what you have to do in practice is limit the voltage you can charge these batteries to to prevent this decomposition. And so that's another reason why you can't fully cite your... Um, you can't use all the lithium in your lithium coal oxide. So there's been a massive worldwide effort to try and identify new materials to try and solve some of these problems. And I'll just talk about some of these materials. So one of the materials um, that was again worked on by John Goodenough when he was in Oxford is the so-called manganese spinel. And this is a bit like a layered compound. So you've got manganese oxide layers there and there. But you've now got pillars of manganese oxide between the layers so that you form a three-dimensional structure. And the lithium ion, shown as these tetrahedra, can now enter the structure from all directions. It's not a two-dimensional structure. And that means the lithium ions can get in very fast. And so you can create high-power devices. And so that's why this system is going into... Um, um, transport applications where you need high power, such as the LEAF and the Chevy Volt. The disadvantage of this chemistry is you've got one lithium and two manganese, so that limits. So you can only get one lithium out per weight uh, unit of two manganese, so that limits its capacity. Another in, uh, invention was, um, again, started with John Goodenough, was lithium ion phosphate. So this is an interesting material. It adopts the olivine structure, so it's a natural mineral in the environment but it's an also an insulator. So not only do we have to get lithiums out, we also got to get electrons in and out if we're going to cycle these materials. And so chemist Michel Armand um, discovered that if you put a small coating of carbon around this material, he could actually find a way of getting the electrons in, and he made it small, he nano-sized it, 
so the electrons could tunnel over a sufficiently small distance, and he could actually get this material to work. And this was a very exciting result because it made you think about different types of chemistries. So we're not just then stuck with iron phosphates. We could think about using other insulators like lithium-ion silicates, lithium-ion borates, and sulfates, and really access chemistries that are much cheaper. So if you could get a lithium-ion silicate to work, you'd have, in principle, one of the cheapest um, systems out there. And so this chemistry works very well. It's safe because it operates at a lower voltage, but actually it's quite difficult to make. And so it's still actually as expensive as lithium cobalt oxide. So people are working on higher voltage chemistries such as lithium manganese phosphates and vanadates to push up the voltage and increase the energy density. And then chemistries that I've been working on for the last few years have involved getting rid of the cobalt and replacing it with, for example, cheaper nickel and manganese oxide. So you have the same layered structure, but now you've got nickel and manganese. And it has sa better safety performance, but it has a poorer rate, but a much higher capacity. And it's also an interesting chemistry because it operates via nickel 2 plus going to 4 plus. So you've got two electrons. And so um, it accesses ways to try and get higher capacity. So thinking about how to get higher capacity, so more electrons per unit of weight or unit of volume, there are new chemistries that people are talking about. So when you pull lots of lithium ions out of things or when you pull multiple electrons out of things, structures find it very difficult to keep the same structure. And so what you end up with are types of chemistries called conversion chemistries. So you could take, for example, a cobalt oxide nanoparticle, you react with lithium, and you form then a cobalt nanoparticle surrounded by lithium oxide. And this reaction involves cobalt 2 plus going to cobalt 0, so that's two electrons, and you get a much higher capacity. So if you could get this to work, this would allow you to access chemistry that would have um, two or three times higher capacities than we have today. There are simple reactions, and I'll talk about these in a minute. You can take lithium and react it with tin, or you can take lithium and react it with silicon, and you have extremely high capacities. So graphite has a capacity of 372 milliampers per gram. Silicon has a capacity of 3,572 milliampers per gram. So it's 10 times higher. The challenge is that if you put this much lithium in, the material expands by 300%. So how do you manage that? If you can imagine your laptop now moves up by 300% when you charge and discharge, you know, that, that is a, that's got an issue that has to be managed. So what I want to do in the last um, 20 minutes is to talk about the work we've been doing in this field. And so what I would um, hypothesize, or uh, I believe strongly, is that as you identify new materials, uh, if you're ever going to get them scaled up to work in these types of devices, you really need to understand what the structures are initially, how they then function as you cycle, and also how they fail. So we're interested in what the bulk of the structure is, in other words, how the atoms are arranged what the surface is like, how it reacts with the electrolytes, how the ionic and the electronic conductivities change. In other words, how do the lithiums move in the structure? Or in these, so this is the lithium ion phosphate structure. This is the layered lithium cobalt oxide structure. And how do the electrons get in and out of these materials? And the technique that I've focused on throughout my work has been lithium nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So I want to illustrate this with three different chemistries that we've been working on. The first is on silicon anodes, which, as I mentioned before, involves multiple changes of multiple redox states and 10 times more capacity. And here the issue I want to talk about is its structure. Then lithium metal, which is the highest possible the material with the highest possible capacity, but it's got tremendous safety issues. And finally, I want to talk about more recent work on supercapacitors and how we're trying to develop methods to understand how these systems work. So just to get everybody up to speed with silicon, this is a plot of voltage versus capacity. So um, what we do is we make up a battery with silicon on one side and lithium on the other side. So we simplify the chemistry, and we just look at the reaction of how lithium reacts with silicon. So I take a crystalline silicon, and I react it with lithium, and this is the voltage at which it reacts. And this is its capacity. So it has a capacity of um, just under 4,000 milliampers per gram. And so you take the crystalline phase and you react and you form an amorphous structure. 
And then if you push down below 50 MeV, you form a, a metastable crystalline phase. On charge, you can see it goes back. Even if you don't understand everything of the, this type of chemistry, you can see this voltage is very different from that voltage. And that so-called hysteresis, or this large overpotential, corresponds to an energy loss. You then go back with two different processes that are quite different from the beginning processes. So what we have to do as chemists is to try and understand what each of these electrochemical signatures correspond to so that we can rationally optimise the functioning of these materials. So um, one of the things about this chemistry is that you start with the crystalline material and you make an amorphous phase. So an amorphous phase is one where you don't have periodic arrangement of the atoms in a lattice. And so you have to think about how you're going to characterise that. And so what we do is to think about materials in the so-called phase diagram. So a phase diagram is a plot of um, composition. There's, a f there's types of structures or the types of phases you get as a function of composition. So this is the lithium-silicon phase diagram where you've got lithium on one side and silicon on the other side. And each of these lines corresponds to different phases. So if you start off and add and react lithium with silicon, you can form phases with five-membered rings and other small clusters of silicon. So the blue is silicon and the yellow are the lithiums around it. Then you can form compounds with double bonds or dumbbells. And then eventually you form phases with isolated silicon ions and, um, in, the, in this structure. And so what we do is we look at these types of phases and we try and identify some of the signatures and the types of chemistries in the system. Um, and then to characterize them, we use nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So this is a technique that some of you might have be familiar with through magnetic resonance imaging, where you use this method to image uh, protons or hydrogen atoms in medical applications or in, in um, material science applications. And what the principle of the method is, it relies on the fact that there are some nuclei that have magnetic moments. And so when you put these magnetic moments in a field, they align up with the field or against the field in the same way as a bar magnet would do. And we apply a radio frequency field that converts the up spins to the down spins, and we measure that energy difference. And that energy difference to first um, depends on the type of element. So we can select for different elements in the material. So we can look at protons, we can look at lithiums, we can look at boron atoms. And we can then work out from the signal how much of each of these atoms is there. So it's quantitative. And then the shift or the specific frequency of this transition also depends on the local environment around this. So we can say something more about the chemistry of the materials. And this is nicely illustrated by looking at the lithium NMR spectra of these different crystalline lithium silicides. So what you see is for the, the one, the lithium silicides with the least amount of lithium is at a peak at about 18 ppm, 18 parts per million. And this turns out to be a signature for lithium surrounding clusters in the compound. If you look at the lithium Li7SI3 that contains dumbbells, this also has a peak at a similar position. And then it starts to shift as you form isolated silicon anions towards the environment for isolated silicon anions. And so even if you don't understand what causes these shifts, you can see that you have a fingerprint or a signature for these different environments in the solid. So you can now then take this information and use that to think about how your battery cycles. So what we do is we make these lithium-ion batteries and we stop them at different points. And each of these balls represents a battery that's been put together, discharged, taken apart, and then we run the NMR. And so these are the model compounds I was talking about. And these are the, um, the NMR spectra, these individual batteries. So these two here correspond to these two here. And this first um, chemistry just corresponds to reacting with the carbon that we've got in the compounds. And then what you see is the formation of lithium silicide peaks, uh, regions that correspond to clusters, and the regions that correspond to isolated silicons. And so this chemistry, um, or this very simply illustrates, just by these simple analogies of the model compounds, that if you start with a crystalline material, you rip the silicon apart to not only form little clusters, but also isolated silicon ions. And as you continue along the chemistry, you can see at the end, you get a shift of the peak in this direction as you break the clusters apart, finally to form isolated ions. 
And we can analyze this in more detail. And what we showed was that you don't follow a thermodynamic pathway because it's very difficult to break silicon up. And so instead, you form a pathway that's more dictated by the kinetics. So the ease of breaking up the bonds of the clusters as opposed to breaking up the silicon bonds of the material itself. So I want to now think about how we can look at things happening in real time. And so in order to do that, um, this is based on work that I developed when I was in sabbatical um, in, in 2007 with Jean-Marie Tarascon in Amiens. And what we did was to devise ways to look at um, battery cycling in situ, so as the batteries are being cycled. And we made little batteries, so-called plastic bag batteries, using the same technology as you use in your, um, in, in your mobile phone. So if you go home this evening and take your mobile phone apart, you'll see and you rip the plastic off inside. And don't, don't do this at home, really. Um, <laughs> you'll see that there is a plastic pouch, and inside are the current collectors, the copper on one side and the aluminium on the other side. This white thing here is a separator that separates the um, anode from the cathode and prevents them reacting. And so you can make these batteries. You put them inside the NMR coil. So we have a coil that excites um, the radio frequency fields that we're going to use to excite the lithium nuclei. We put them in a magnet, and this is a magnet at Stony Brook, and we connect it up to a battery cycler. And then when this works, you can then watch what's happen, happening in real time. Now, this experiment took a few days, and you'll be glad to know that I sped this up for you. So here's the electrochemistry moving along. And here's now the NMR spectra of this battery as it's going through its paces. So what you're seeing here is the full battery. So on one side, you see the lithium methyl of the anode. This peak is dominated by the lithium ions in the electrolyte. And the regions over here are where you see the lithiums, the lithiums in the clusters and the lithiums due to the isolate, nearby the isolated silicon. So in case you missed that, I'll just show you a contour plot that shows it more clearly. So here again is the electrochemistry. Here is the formation. This is the reaction of the carbon initially. Then you form isolated ions and you form the clusters. And then you form this negative peak that we hadn't seen before. So when you see that sort of thing, you say, well, you have to sort of ask yourself, is it just that we can't make batteries? Um, and is it just they don't work? Or is there something else that's going on between the in situ and the ex situ results? And so this um, mystery was solved when my student at the time, Barish Key, made a battery and he, he left it running and he went away for about 600 minutes. And when he actually came back, he noticed that peak had disappeared. And so what's going on in this chemistry is that you form a lithium silicide that's so highly reduced, it reduces the electrolyte and is itself oxidized. And this is a so-called self-discharge process. So this is the same sorts of processes that happen if you... Um, I don't know, many of you have probably had an experience where you've got your left a, a laptop overcharged for too long, it's got hot, and after that it never worked quite as well ever again. And that was a self-discharge process. And so this is the sort of thing that you really don't want to have to happen. So once you've seen that, you have to think about how can you prevent it. And it turns out one simple way of preventing it is to take a binder, so this was the thing that held the silicon together, and the binder that's used in these chemistries is actually a cellulose product. And the cellulose ends up covering the active materials, and you can then prevent or at least slow down this self-discharge process. So instead of taking hours, you can now um, keep the batteries fully charged, and they take about a month to discharge. So this is not a perfect solution. A month discharge process is not ideal, but at least you've got ideas about how to solve this discharge problem. So can we extract further information? So we made these batteries. We had lithium on one side, silicon on the other side. And just to remind you what's going on, when we discharge, the lithium moves from one side to the other side. So we would expect, if we looked at the NMR signal of this lithium methyl peak, the intensity should decrease as the lithiums went from this side to the other side. But what we noticed, so here's the NMR peak of the lithium, is that after the discharge, so after this process, after about 4,500 minutes, nothing had happened. The intensity stayed almost constant with a few fluctuations. And then on charge, where we take the lithiums out from the silicon and put them on the lithium, the intensity had increased. So it looked like we'd created magically more lithium in the cell. And turned out what the problem was, 
was something called a skin depth problem. So it turns out that if you have a radio frequency field and you try to use that to penetrate through a metal, um, it if you work out the mathematics or you put the numbers in, it can only penetrate about the first 15 microns. So if you have a lithium sheet, you can get through about the first 15 microns. But as you charge and charge and discharge your batteries, lithium doesn't plate smoothly on the lithium. In form, instead, it forms these dendritic structures. And these dendritic structures are the reasons why you get some of these types of pictures. And they're the reasons why people don't use lithium anodes in, in, in at the moment in commercial batteries. Because what these dendrites do is they continue to grow and grow and grow, and they push their way through the separators a bit like the way ivy grows through concrete, it finds us some little cracks to get through, and then it can short circuit uh, with the cathode on the other side, and then cause um, very rapid reactions, heat, and explosions and fires. So this is a serious problem. So what we we then realised was that we were able to not to see all of the lithium anodes, but we were actually to see, able to see these dendritic structures. So these dendritic structures have sizes about one to two microns. So the NMR can see these, but can only see the surface of the lithium metal. So we devised a way of being able to see where these dendrites were, which we could then use to understand when and how these things formed. And this is just an illustration where we've taken a sheet of lithium on one side and a sheet of lithium on the other, and we're cycling backwards and forwards with increasingly high current to try and understand when you form these dendrites. So this is the lithium metal. And as the current goes up, you can watch it then start to form at the high rates. So just with a very simple technique, we can now work out when you form these dendrites, what you can then, what additives and what electrolytes you can add to try and minimize the formation of these dendrites. And it's these dendrites that actually prevent you from charging batteries rapidly in transport applications because people are concerned that instead of plating the lithium safely into carbon, it forms these dendritic structures, and you can end up with short circuits. And actually, it's the formation of little lithium particles inside your batteries, which is why you shouldn't take your battery apart overnight at home, because when you take the battery apart and it's exposed to air, it will, will catch fire. So be warned. Um, so then the next thing we wanted to know was where, where were these dendrites forming? And so what we did was to turn to MRI, to magnetic resonance imaging, the technique that people are more familiar with in medical applications. And so these are some of our first images where you've got sheets of lithium, and this is the original material. And then we cycled it, and you can see from the image now, so we're now encoding the information uh, in two dimensions. You can see now the formation of this dendrite in between the lithium sheets. And now what we're trying to do is think about ways that we can do this in even bigger batteries. So I want to end by just talking about supercapacitors. So supercapacitors are types of systems that operate now via a different mechanism, um, as I mentioned before, with these highly porous structures. And often these porous structures are made out of carbon. Turns out one of the best forms of carbon is coconut shells. So um, a lot of the carbons that you use, for example, in water purification are made by the same way. You take a coconut shell, you carbonize it, and you make these carbons in massive surface areas. So this has a surface area of about 1,700 meters squared per gram, which is about six or seven tennis courts in one gram of that material. And so that's why it's so good at absorbing things in water filtration applications. Or there are more sophisticated ways. You can take a titanium carbide and react it with chlorine and make, make these very regular pore size, pores, pores um, of about 0.6 to 1 nanometers and this was chemistry developed by Yuri Gagotsky and Patrice Simon a number of years ago who were collaborating with to do this. So what we're trying to do now is to understand how sorry, the process of charging these capacitors work, how the ions react with the surface. And so what we need to do is to understand, again, these fingerprints of the different environments in the solid. So what we do is look at absorption. So we look at different amounts of the electrolyte, so our electrolyte is acetonitrile with tetraethyl ammonium and bor BF form ions. We do boron NMR to look at the boron, boron in the bor form minus, and we look at that as a function of concentration. And so when you put small amounts on, all you see are the ions that strongly absorb to the surface, 
you put more on, then you get the weakly adsorbed ions, and eventually you get free ions floating around in the solution. We can then ask questions like, how long do ions live on the surface? Are they held back tightly, or do they move? And we do this via so-called two-dimensional NMR experiments. And without um, going into a lot of details, we can do experiments where we wait different periods of times. And if the ions move in, for example, 500 milliseconds, so half a second, you end up with so-called cross peaks. And from that, you can actually measure how mobile the ions are on and off the surface. And then we start to think about how these things function. So what we did was to do, again, in situ NMR spectroscopy. We designed a special supercapacitor where you've got uh, one electrode that sits in the coil and the other electrode doesn't sit in the coil, and that allows us to look at the individual processes separately. And when we charge our supercapacitor, you can see the intensity increases. So if you put an, a positive voltage on one side, the negative ions move to the positive voltage, so it's all as we expected, which was good. And then we can look at what happens to the environments. So at zero volts, we see the strongly adsorbed ions. When we charge this to negative volts, the negatively charged ions don't want to sit on a negatively charged surface, so they jump off, and the signal disappears, and you get these mobile free ions floating around in solution. Well, as if you go in the opposite direction, you can see the free ion, um, sorry, the strongly bound ions, they, the peak shifts and it grows in intensity, and that and other NMR phenomena shows you that you have a much stronger interaction with the surface at positive voltages, as you'd expect. The other thing that we can do is then look and see how fast the capacitors equilibrate to try and understand how to optimize this process. And this is just an illustration of going from minus 2 volts to plus 2 volts. So with that, I just want to end by um, talking a little bit about the future. So there's a lot of new chemistries that are out there. One of the ones that people are very excited by is the so-called lithium air chemistry, where you take lithium metal with oxygen and you form a lithium peroxide. And if you could get that chemistry to work, that has the potential of almost achieving the energy density, not the volumetric density, of gasoline. And so this is some of the first oxygen NMR spec we've acquired of these materials, where we're using the NMR signature of oxygen to detect this product and understand when it forms and when it doesn't um, when decomposition products such as carbonates form. Other areas that I think are very interesting are the ideas of using biomass to make organic materials that you could use. Instead of burning your biomass, if you could convert that into an organic electrode, you'd have a totally sustainable battery. So with that, I'd like to end by hopefully um, reminding you that I've shown you that we can develop new probes of local structure that allow us to really attack and interrogate very complex materials and understand how they function during and after um, battery performance. And this information can feed directly into improving materials for these applications. Um, so um, I'll first of all thank the people who have been involved and then come back to some of the prospects. So this is my new group in Cambridge. Uh, um, so the people who did the work were Barish Key in Stony Brook and Rangit Bhattacharya, Thomas Costa, who's in the audience and is somewhere in that bridge over there, who worked on the super caps with Elodie, who's also somewhere there. I'm a little bit short-sighted, so I'm probably going to point to the wrong person. Um, Michael over there worked on the lithium air, along with Pr Professor Julian Goward, who was a sabbatical visitor with her two children. These are not my new graduate students working on there. And we've been very happy to have very great collaborators in Amiens, uh, and, um, UCL, Andrew Morris and Chris Picard from St. Andrews, who've been helping with the theory of the silicon work in the audience, and Patrice C Simon and Yuri Gotsky from Toulouse and Drexel. So I'm very grateful to all of my group, some of them who are here today, whose work I've talked about, and also some of the work that I haven't been able to talk about because of time. And so just to sort of end, I think that um, in terms of prospects, electrification of transport is really the most practical short-term solution for CO2 reductions. Hybrid electric vehicles are a reality, and the CO2 um, reduction legislation is really making, is playing an important role on this, and it's really pushing the development of HEVs and high-end cars. Um, PHEVs are, are a realistic prospect, but we do as a society need to think about the infrastructure issues. Uh, electric vehicles will really depend on how good people like me and 
particularly my students are and postdocs that are bringing down the cost of these lithium ion batteries. So progress will be um, incremental but will be significant, but it's important to keep the options open and um, understand what's going on. Thank you very much for listening to me. That's a splendid lecture, and we have plenty of time for questions. So if uh, Professor Gray will take questions. Now, there are two microphones, so if you'd like to ask a question, could you put your hand up and then wait for a microphone to reach you uh, before you speak? Right, it's one there. Claire, you better come to the mic. Oh, no, you've got I'm mic. Okay. And is there another one we can line up for the... Yes, okay, we've got two questions. Okay, shall I start? Um, I was working at Sony during the time where we had problems with lithium-ion broadcast camera batteries, and uh, I was interested to, from what you were talking. Is it would I be right in thinking that they are safer if they are transported in a flat in a flat discharge state rather than a fully charged state? Uh, because most of the time, if you're working on location, you'd always be taking them in a charged state because you would not want to arrive in a location with them flat. And just one other little very basic point, compared with when I was at school, is it now correct to use anode-cathode terminology based on electron flow? In other words, what I thought was a cathode is now an anode and vice versa. So to start with your easiest question, I mean, obviously, when you charge a battery, you create materials that are in their full age, highly oxidised and highly reduced state, so it's much more reactive. So, yes that's when they're the most dangerous. And so you can question whether, for example, um, you should be allowed to charge your battery on aeroplanes. So Macintoshes don't allow you to do that. Um, so one should, particularly in transport, transport these things in discharge states. In terms of your question about anodes and cathodes, I was going to try and find the right slide, but I seem to have lost my... Um, so we get around that by talking about positives and negatives. So because um, so this is a question about the fact anodes and cathodes were named because ions move to the anodes and cations move to the cathodes, but if you're charging and discharging, then you're going to have to change the nomenclature. So instead, we, if we're being correct, we will say positive, so the, the um, thing of a positive, higher potential and the negative. And, but yet... Anode and cathode are often used in the literature when people discharge them. So, there's a question over there. That's a good question. Um, so you give us a lot, perhaps too much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, mine is a general question. Uh, uh, the batteries are going to replace oil, it seems, one day. And uh, but where? batteries would not be able to replace oil. As a so, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've put forward the fact that batteries will totally replace oil. I mean, it's a very difficult challenge to beat petroleum as one of the most dense form of energy. So I personally would like to hope that they will replace transport in shorter applications. If you're talking about range and long distance, it's going to be very difficult to make a battery that's going to last for 400 miles. It's also not going to be effective to have to carry around that size of the battery pack that you're going to need on your daily commute. You know, you're not going to want to be ca having this weighty thing in there. It's not going to be very energy efficient. So in short-term travel, I would hope that it will make a serious impact. I think that aviation is another area where one will may decide that that's where you're going to burn your CO2 or produce your CO2. There are planes, there are micro light planes that are being built with electric um, batteries. They're expensive and they don't fly very far. So um, personally, I hope I'm going to be on a transatlantic flight with um, aviation fuel and not a battery for many years. But there are applications in these shorter distances where it does make sense to do it. And I think we do need to think about as a society of where we're going to use our um, fuel for. And I would argue that it's a better use of fuel to be making a plastic or high-end product 
than just to be burning it. And maybe that means we don't travel as often. Although you saw, saw from the beginning of my slide that I also have a research group at Stony Brook, so I do spend quite a bit of time on an aeroplane. Hello, um, my name is Adam Chase. Um, you've talked very eloquently about the benefits of lithium, but obviously pointed to many of its disadvantages as well. Do you see um, potential for combinations of other materials other than lithium? Um, so, yes, is the answer to that question. Um, so there are, there are technologies such as sodium sulfur, which are cheaper, in principle, but they're still not actually, in reality, any cheaper. Um, there's, there's a, we do some work in our lab on replacing lithium with sod sodium. Unfortunately, sodium is more reactive. It has more dangerous... Um, so that's, there's a safety aspect there. The sodium sulfur, the sodium zebra cells all operate at 200 degrees. So you're looking at making um, batteries that you have to keep at those temperatures. So that's a realistic... Um, model for delivery vans where you can have a fleet where you keep things at, at temperatures. They're also being produced by GE for trains, for example. So I think there are areas where different batteries will have different roles. If you look at the cheap markets like golf carts or important things like that, um, lead-acid batteries are, going to, are important in those types of applications. Lead-acid batteries are important in China where you want really cheap battery packs and distance is not always an important thing. We have a recycling industry for lead. It makes sense to, to put those in. And then um, if you think about the big batteries, sodium sulfur is again as a big battery. The other idea are batteries based on so-called redox flow, where you flow in a reduced or oxidized liquid. Or it could even be a suspension of particles that you oxidize and reduce. And that has a possibility of scalable. I mean, the dream is that you might be able to pump in your oxidized liquid in a car. There's some tremendous challenges there. of Corrosion, they're not very effective on a volumetric basis. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer in keeping the options open. I think the message is, though, that lithium is ready for transport applications and smaller applications. But I don't think that should be at the exclusion of other technology at this particular point in time. Any further questions? No, that's perfect timing, actually, because we were asked to wind it up by 7.30, so I'm not going to squeeze any more questions out of you. Um, I'd like to thank on your behalf, um, Claire, for this uh, wonderful lecture. I think it's clear that um, she knows her stuff. I th didn't know there was so much to be known about batteries. There was plenty of uh, food for thought there. And she's obviously an excellent choice for the Kavli lecture, the first Kavli uh, lecture, which is for energy and the environment. So I think that's worked out really well. So, and I have to present Claire with some bits and pieces. Now, you'll have received one of these already this year with your certificate from membership to the Royal Society. Here's another one for the Kavli Award. <laughs> and... <laughs> the Kavli Medal... Very first one. Thank you. And I think this must be a check. <laughs> Thanks very much. Ian.